Hello everybody, welcome back to the Stat Dose podcast. We're here today doing a stat medical topic on ventilatory support. We're going to have a quick look at some key respiratory physiology and some key pathological terms. We'll then go into some of the clinical aspects, looking at indications, contraindications, and when and why we might be using different types of ventilatory support. Excellent. So we're just going to talk about ventilatory support. And I think that the key, we're going to start with the, the key message here, which is that actually you don't need to know much about ventilatory support. I would agree with that. Good. I don't know anything really about ventilatory support. No. Or much, much else. <laughs> <laughs> right. You just need to know when you might need it and to get help. Exactly. So so th- this this is ventilatory support for the generalist, for the you know, foundation one or two doctors in hospital who's not a respiratory trainee, who's not an anaesthetic trainee. The, the key, as, as Helen says, is to know actually when you might need somebody who's going to need it and how to get help. But in terms of what we're classifying as ventilatory support, there's two big arms. So arm A is invasive ventilatory support, which is intubating with an ET tube, sticking on a ventilator. And there's non-invasive ventilation, which is essentially a tight-fitting mask, uh, either using a CPAP or BiPAP, which we'll talk more about later. But as I said, I think just, just to hammer it home again, the key is you don't need that much of a thorough understanding. This is just going to be a brief overview. Don't sweat it. We're just going to talk about some, some physiology and some key terms uh, before we get into the, the nitty gritty. So oxygenation, obviously important, but it's mainly driven by a diffusion of oxygen uh, across the alveolar capillary membrane. And the key sort of respiratory bit that drives your oxygenation is inspiration. So if you're worried about insp- uh, oxygenation, you want to increase that. So there's two ways we can do this. So we can either change the fraction of inspired oxygen, essentially the amount of oxygen that you breathe in, or we can increase the mean airways pressure. So those are your two ways to increase oxygenation. In terms of carbon dioxide, so again, CO2 clearance is uh, driven by diffusion across the alveolar membrane, but it's largely expiration. So if you're worried about a CO2 problem, you need to be thinking about expiration and how you can increase that. So physiologically, the two ways we can do that are by changing what's known as the millet volume, which is essentially your respiratory rate times by your tidal volume, i.e. the total volume of air that you shift in a minute. And that's typically around six litres a minute for most adults, tidal breath being about 500 mils each, and then a respiratory rate of between 12 and 20. So two ways to increase your CO2 clearance, increasing your respiratory rate, uh, which you can do on a ventilator, or increasing the, the tidal volume, so mainly by pressure. Now, the other two key terms we need to know about are type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. Now, type 1 respiratory failure occurs when you have hypoxia without hypercapnia, so i.e. that's an oxygenation failure. And type 2 respiratory failure occurs when you get hypercapnia, often with a bit of hypoxia, but you don't necessarily have to have hypoxia with that. And that's essentially a ventilatory failure, or a failure with expiration. Before we start ventilatory support, what sort of things do we need to consider? Well, it's very important, Matt, that we make sure our patients are appropriately selected and, of course, consented. We need to also think about where we're going with this if we're going to start them on ventilatory support. So it's really important to discuss with the team and also with the patient about their treatment escalation plan and think about their ceiling of care. Ventilatory support can only be started by CTT doctors or above or other senior members of the team. So, for example, senior nurses um, in the respiratory ward or in ITU or senior respiratory physios. In terms of contraindications, um, these can include airway obstruction, pneumothorax without a chest strain, recent upper GI bleed or GI surgery or facial surgery, um, as well as any facial or airway burns. If we go on to thinking about the different types of ventilatory support, as Matt said, we have non-invasive and invasive. So maybe, Helen, you can tell us a little bit more about those. The non-invasive ventilatory support um, we often use in the hospital is CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. So CPAP is only set off by a spontaneously respirating patient or person, and it just gives you a delivered amount of pressurised air to keep your alveoli open to help aid the diffusion of oxygen. You have a mask which is is really tightly fitted to the patient's face and the fit of the mask is the thing that makes it most effective. So if you've got a poorly fitting mask, it's not going to effectively ventilate that patient for you. You can set it at different levels and set different amounts of um, flow of oxygen. So if you've got someone that is um, a CO2 retainer, you might want a very low level of oxygen 
What conditions then is it going to be helpful in? CPAP is used to increase oxygenation in type 1 respiratory failure. Keeps or splints the alveoli open. So if someone's got pulmonary edema when their alveoli are full of fluid, so the gaseous exchange occurs more slowly due to the fluid, then by keeping those alveoli open with PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, it allows better gaseous exchange to occur. It's generally started at 4 to 5 centimetres of H2A. BiPAP is a biphasic positive airway pressure device and it's used to increase oxygenation and improve ventilation in type 2 respiratory failure. There's two settings and you can have positive airway pressure on inspiration and or expiration. IPAP and EPAP. EPAP is continuous positive airway pressure where you use it on inspiration and expiration and is used to improve oxygenation above just same as CPAP. So if you haven't got a CPAP machine available, you can give CPAP essentially on the BiPAP, biphasic machine. However, IPAP, inspiration, positive airway pressure, improves ventilation by increasing your tidal volumes and therefore helps you to clear your carbon dioxide more easily by giving you a bigger tidal volume with each inspiration. And patients in type 2 respiratory failure find it really hard to take a big deep breath in. So it's really useful in COPD ex- exacerbations cystic fibrosis and hypercapnic respiratory failure and they generally start at 15 to 5 so 15 centimetres of water on inspiration and leave it at 5 and positive end airway pressure. Both options have oxygen ports so you can add in titrated oxygen delivered at whatever you'd like. If you're called to see a sick patient on ventilatory support, it's always a good shout to increase your um, inspired oxygen and then call for help. Because unless you're confident and experienced, it's quite a complex system to fiddle with. So don't ever be afraid to shout for help. Really good point, isn't that? As, as a junior doctor, mm. we, we don't want people fiddling with machines. If you're called to someone who's sick and on ventilatory support, as you say, it's stick the FiO2 up on, on the machine. Do an ABCDE, call for help. Don't really fiddle with too much else. And lots of the newer machines have got like a 100% button. Mm. So it will deliver 100% FiO2 for one minute or two minutes. So it won't continue past that. So if you've got someone that will retain CO2 too much, then it, it won't indefinitely give a high flow of oxygen and cause any other issues that that can cause. And how about OxyFlow? I see that being used a lot more. So Octoflow is a really good option for patients that aren't tolerating the face mask. Because not only is it really uncomfortable and not very nice, you can't communicate with patients, they can't eat and drink with the face mask on. They can also cause horrendous pressure sores on people's faces, especially over the bridge of the nose. It's been especially useful with um, COVID patients. So it's basically a nasal oxygen delivery device which delivers high flow oxygen nasally. So patients tolerate it a lot better. Mm, Sounds great. So, yeah. So it's exactly the same as CPAP, but via your nasal passages rather than um, oral and nasal passages. So can they still <laughs> talk and eat and drink while they've got that going? They can. The nose? Yeah, it's That's great. Brilliant. And it's a lot easier to put a patient prone as well. So mm. lots of the patients, the COVID patients, have um, had real difficulties and proning. So the next is invasive ventilation. It's when you put a um, tracheal tube in, you sedate someone and ventilate them via a machine. You can do exactly the same, but with more finesse and fine-tuning on a ventilator than you can with the BiPAP or the CPAP machine. So, what you would need to know about is complications. As Helen already mentioned, mask issues can be one of the biggest things that cause problems and that is fairly easily fixed. So air leakage is quite common in non-invasive ventilation. So it's really important that you make sure the mask fits properly and adjust if needed. Um, So this could be particularly if somebody has a bit of an unusually shaped face or if they have... Why did you look at me when you said (laughs) unusually shaped face? Straight to me. (laughs) Or if they have a big beard, perhaps, might be necessary to... Why did you look at Helen when you said (laughs) that? Might be necessary to shave that off. I wax. I don't know what you're talking about. You look beautiful, my dear. So yeah, just think about making sure the mask fits and adjust things that you can if necessary to make sure it fits better when you're not having air leaking at sites. Another issue is that it can be not well tolerated by the patient. So you've got a few options here. You can either give some opiates to try and reduce their stress and discomfort. 
or you could just stop the treatment completely and consider alternative options. So that could be switching to invasive ventilation, or it could be that you can look at medical or more conservative options, or it might be that you need to be thinking about palliation in this patient. Vomiting can also be a problem. Um, so the stomach can be overinflated with non-invasive ventilation. So you're basically blowing a load of air into a balloon, and that is bad. In the case of blowing it into your stomach, this can cause vomiting um, and also risk of aspiration. In invasively ventilated patients, they have an NG tube in place to aspirate the stomach. And then last of all, if your settings are too high, um, you can result in high intrathoracic pressure and consequently risk of pneumothorax, risk of compression of the great vessels causing decreased venous return and hypotension and barotrauma as well. So just to summarise some of the key points then, as we said before, you don't need a thorough understanding of ventilatory support. It's much more important to have a good grounding in some of the basic concepts and the physiology rather than getting lost in the detail of ventilatory support. Type 1 respiratory failure occurs when there's hypoxia without hypercapnia and it's an oxygenation issue or an oxygenation failure. Type 2 respiratory failure is where there's hypercapnia with or without hypoxia and that's more of a ventilatory failure. Remember that oxygenation is largely driven by inspiration and we can increase this by changing the fraction of inspired oxygen and slash or the mean airways pressure. CO2 clearance is largely driven by your minute volume, therefore we can increase CO2 clearance by increasing the respiratory rate or increasing the tidal volumes. In terms of ventilatory support, remember we've got non-invasive ventilation, which is CPAP, BiPAP and also Optiflow that we mentioned, and we have invasive ventilatory support, which is sedating somebody, putting an endotracheal tube down and placing them on a ventilator. CPAP delivers a continuous positive airway pressure throughout inspiration and expiration, which helps to splint open bronchioles and alveoli. It's therefore useful in type 1 respiratory failure, particularly pulmonary edema and obstructive sleep apnea. BiPAP is used to help clear CO2, where the inspiratory pressure helps increase tidal volumes and therefore CO2 clearance. And this is particularly useful in COPD exacerbations and other hypercapnic respiratory failures. Now the key learning point as a junior doctor, if you're called to a sick patient who's on ventilatory support, the best things to do are increase the FiO2, do an ABCDE, call for help early, and that's the best way to keep your patient safe.